digestion in a basic way is kind of split into two camps you've got diarrhea and you've got constipation and in today's clinic we're going to talk about constipation so let, let's just start with i know without telling people to suck eggs what what is it yeah so constipation is um it's basically a slow movement of the bowel so it can it can present in two ways really to varying degrees of severity so um either people aren't able to produce a bowel movement um frequently enough so maybe going two three four five six seven days or even longer in certain cases without being able to produce a bowel movement or the other way in which it presents itself is actually somebody that's going to the toilet every day but they're not actually fully evacuating the bowel. So they can get some areas of the bowel that are sort of impacted with fecal matter and it's not actually all clearing out. So those, but those, that, those two things really describe what constipation is. And the symptoms that people feel while they're having it are? So while well, you can feel quite sluggish with it, it's a sluggish bowel that can lead to like low energy levels and things like that. Um, sometimes it can actually cause some, um, some discomfort, some bloating. Um, and sometimes some cramps, but the cramps often are just before the bowel movement. And then when you pass the stool, then the cramp is relieved again. OK, so um, this is more of an obvious one than some of the topics we do. But let's talk about what the connection is to the gut and actually what is going on behind the scenes when you talk about constipation. What, why are people having those symptoms? And then we'll get on to how you can sort of find permanent relief from that. Yeah, so constipation is such a common thing. And I think there's probably not many of us that can genuinely say they haven't had episodes of constipation at some point in their life. So there's, although it's a really common thing, it's actually quite complex in all the different factors that contribute to it. So for some people, if it's just a mild episode, it could be because they've just undergone a period of stress or they're not drinking enough water or they're not really eating enough fibre in their diet and just some simple tweaks of the obvious things might be all that they need. But the sort of constipation that I see in my clinic is much more long-standing than that and much more severe where those basic tricks haven't worked. Yeah, so certain people, even if they jack up their fluids, yeah. they eat as much fibre as they can, yeah. they go overboard with it, yeah. it still doesn't change. Doesn't shift. So yeah. what's going on? Yeah, so... Um, these people, um, there could be there, there could be any number of things going on, but one of the things that I come across a lot in my practice is SIBO, so small intestinal bowel overgrowth, and you could this can contribute to either diarrhea or constipation, and it can cause just a lot of general disruption in the gut itself. But with um, SIBO that's causing constipation, it's often the type of organism that's encouraged to grow in the small intestine produces methane gas. And this actually starts to impact on the movement of all the food through the whole length of the, the GI tract so that it just it's so slow to pass. So the frustrating thing is once you get in a cycle of this, the the slow passage of the food from one end of the GI tract to the other actually enhances the small intestinal bowel overgrowth and you get stuck in then the very vicious cycle. So I see a lot of people that fall into that category and actually it takes not just increasing your water and increasing your fibre and in actual fact that could potentially make that person worse. Um, it's quite a it's quite a thorough investigation needed, maybe involving some tests as well to really understand what's going on in the gut there. Because if this particular methane producing bugs are overgrowing in the small intestine, then we need to get rid of them because they're impairing the transit through the gut. And lots of people that have had constipation, if they've been to their GP, um, you know, they might get um, uh, things like... Uh, you know, relief, certain tablets that you can take or certain uh, laxatives to help, mm. but that's not going to solve the problem. No. So when you talk about testing, what sort of testing can people do to find out what is going on? So if it was really severe and long standing, what I do initially is just do some basic advice to just try and get things moving. Um, that might include things like addressing the stomach acid. We've discussed a lot before about stomach acid and we've done a whole separate podcast just on that alone. Um, but that is really crucial in just ensuring that the, the right secretions are going through the gut from the top to the bottom, because if that's not sufficient, then it will affect subsequent things further down. So that's the sort of thing I'll try and address first. If that doesn't produce the results that I would expect, then we do further testing. So we, if we want to look at what's in the small intestine, we can do a SIBO test, which is a breath test. Or if we want to look at what's going on in the, the large intestine and other stuff going on in the gut, then we'll look at the stool sample, we'll send that off to the lab and see whether what that produces. And what we're looking for is 
lots of imbalances we're not looking for lots of imbalances but that's what normally appears in the types of bacteria that are growing in the colon and also the amount of bacteria that's growing in the small intestine and if it is in significant overgrowth what type is it because it really severely impacts then the transit time through the gut so SIBO is a thing on its own you can test for that and there's yeah. more information about SIBO on the yeah. so go to gutology.co.uk if you want to read about that yeah. what other things away from SIBO can be causing more chronic constipation are there other areas yeah so um, in terms of the movement through the gut we have like different mechanisms at play of what t takes the food from one end of the digestive tract to the other end and where then you excrete it. So peristalsis is something that most people have heard of, which is the movement of the food once it's in the gut to get it from one position to the next. And if you're under stress, that can disrupt peristalsis. If you've got a problem that is altering the nervous system, like lack of B vitamins even can sometimes cause a decrease in the amount of peristalsis. So That's lack of vitamin D. Vitamin B. B. Oh, vitamin B, B. B vitamins, yes. Um, so that can be impaired. But what is really interesting in terms of constipation is another thing. It's like lesser known, really, um, something called the migrating motor complex. So peristalsis is the movement of food through the GI tract. But the migrating motor complex is something that happens when the gut is empty. So when there's no food in it whatsoever, the migrating motor complex is the, is the mechanism that's responsible for actually kind of cleaning out the intestinal tract. So it actually gets rid of this bacteria from the small intestine and it pushes it along to where it's meant to be housed, which is in the colon. So if you're like snacking and eating really frequently, you're not actually gonna get, you'll miss that because it's only activated when the, then, when the digestive system is completely empty. And the second you eat something, it's switched off. So what that system is, it's like a, it's it's got different phases of it, but it's essentially a, like a sequence of contractions that happen that are just sort of sweeping out the gut and making sure all the la last little debris and bacteria is cleansed. So it's like a clean up routine. So for people that are suffering from constipation, or mm. generally just this is just, you know, you can yeah. improve, you know, anyone doing their normal gut health. This is something you want to happen. You don't want to be snacking often. Would you, three meals a day and having gapped intervals in between them, is that enough time to get that system? Yeah, so ideally, like if you have constipation, you want to go at least four to five hours between meals. And that is that would involve no snacks as well. So you'd probably want to go to more of a traditional three meals a day routine of having breakfast at, say, 7 a.m., lunch at perhaps 12, 30, 1 o'clock, and then evening meal at about 6 p.m., and nothing in between. And that might help reset because you're allowing that to take place. And would you, uh, you know, a lot of people take a long gap between dinner and the evening and then breakfast the next day, that kind of a yeah. mini 16-hour fast. Yeah. Is that helpful pe for people with constipation? Very, very helpful because it's actually allowing the, the this migrating motor complex to recover so if it's at a really low ebb because you just constantly got food in the system or things are just so slow that there's never there never is that empty time in the gi tract so a minimum of 12 hours fasting overnight is uh, is essential for somebody with constipation so just to recap generally though uh, stomach acid is just always a great one to go to and there's yeah. simple ways that you can we'll do a whole another episode on this but simple ways that you can jack that up are things like just a bit of apple cider vinegar before yeah. you eat yeah um, or if you're in uh, contact with a nutritionist you can speak about certain supplements that can help raise your stomach acid up um, and then moving on from there uh, can you reach out to a nutritionist that does gold standard testing someone that has access to a laboratory that can do that if you can't um, you can ask us on the gutology website and we can find somebody uh, near you and then general for people that are suffering from constipation make sure you have that gap between meals and you're not snacking in between and if you really want to get on top of it see if you can do that 16 hour fast which sounds bad but actually you know if you have dinner at what six o'clock in the mm. evening what yeah. would that take you to about uh 10 the next day yeah it's yeah. about 10 o'clock the next day so you, yeah that's not too it's bad, actually easily it? it's it's easy it's easy to do it's easier than it is feels when you say 16 hours fast you know most people think oh, yeah that's but a you lot can have, but it's you not can have a coffee with that a few hours yeah. before yeah so that yeah we often do that in the mornings we just yeah. have, you have a coffee at like eight mm. Mm. and then you don't eat until 10 and it, that sort yeah. of fills the gap a i bit. think it, it's like a really common thing to do when you've like got constipation is sometimes it can make you feel like quite full up and not really like you your appetite you don't really morning. feel hungry yeah. so people are not really thinking oh, i just eat my 
like a big meal at breakfast, lunch and dinner. They're more like grazing. That's the sort of classic behavior of somebody with constipation is a grazer, leaving yeah. a little bit, then cut fuzzy later a little bit more. But actually it's making the whole things wor- worse because you're not allowing your gut to be empty at all. So you just lose the benefit. And if there is some SIBO going on there, that is going to be just worsened massively by the snacking. You need to have the inherent cleaning mechanism of your gut active. Otherwise, you, you, won't, you won't be able to get better from it. But if you... So so yes, if if the stomach acid isn't sufficient enough and you and you correct that, but still there's problems, then it probably is the time when you would work with a nutritional therapist because um, if there's SIBO present to a really vast degree and a really chronic degree, then it takes um, it takes quite a thorough program of diet. So things like the low FODMAP diet might be implicated here or the specific carbohydrate diet. These are different dietary techniques that are designed to actually reduce the, the food source for the bacteria in the small intestine. But you would need support to do that kind of program. And if you're reaching out to find a nutritionist, just make sure it's somebody that is capable of getting that testing done, has the links with the laboratories and has the the background and the qualifications to be able to sort of see that process through and again we can help online via the website connect you with somebody if you need to